Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Pepperell Christian Fellowship. It's good to hear all the, the conversations and everybody getting to, to talk with one another. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, if you're a guest this morning, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. Glad you're spending your morning this morning worshiping our triune God with us together. Uh, and would love to, if you are visiting this morning, feel free to take one of our welcome packs out there. Uh, that's for you to learn more about us and what we're doing here as a church. Uh, and also, if you're visiting and you need a Bible, uh, we will have some that we can loan out or you can take one from the foyer. Uh, we'd be glad to have you take one of those and, and keep it, bring it with you uh, as our gift to you. Uh, important reminder this morning as we get started. Next Sunday, June 20th, is our service change. Our hours will change for the summer. Uh, so the 8.30 service stays there. Uh, this service, which you're now here at 11 o'clock, will be at 10.30. So if you plan to come at the second service, uh, plan to come a, a bit earlier uh, so that you make it. So uh, throughout the summer, will be 8.30 and 10.30. Uh, also, a reminder that Pepperell is doing a July, 4th of July parade and fireworks this year on the 26th. Uh, and so on the 27th, Sunday the 27th, uh, we're going to do our annual service Sunday. Uh, that's when we serve our community by cleaning up after all the fun that was had at the 4th of July parade and fireworks. So we'll clean up uh, on the town field and the parade route down Main Street. Uh, it's one way we can be serving uh, our community. Uh, and so that morning on the 27th, we'll have one service at 8.30, uh, and we'll all join together. Uh, if you have one of your the PCF blue T-shirts, please wear one of those, and we'll go out together, uh, and we'll clean up the parade route and town field uh, together. There's also, if you're not up or able to do the outdoor stuff, we'll have indoor projects, really writing cards for our first responders here in Pepperell, uh, really as a thank you uh, for all that they do. Uh, so that's another, there you go. <laughs> Cue up the siren. <laughs> um, and so that's one way we can give thanks uh, for the way God uses them uh, in our lives. Then we'll come back and we'll have a picnic lunch together. So just bring a picnic lunch. We'll provide some water and we'll just relax for a bit and enjoy one another uh, to celebrate. Uh, youth group and youth group parents, we're celebrating the start of our summer youth group schedule and welcoming in our incoming seventh graders uh, by going to Max's Country Golf in Tingsboro. A uh, week from this Tuesday, so Tuesday the 22nd, uh, we'll do some mini golf, some bumper boats, ice cream. Sounds like fun. If any of the adults want to sign up, come on it. No, it's only for the kids. Unless you want to drive, that's okay too. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to meet at PCF at 6 o'clock as usual. We'll come back at 9.30, so a little extended time uh, to make sure we get to, to do all those things. Uh, the cost is $17 and bring extra for ice cream. Uh, and the reason we say not a specific number is it's up to you how much e ice cream you're going to eat. So that's how much extra money you'll need to bring for ice cream. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to let you know that the sign-up went out to all youth group parents. If you didn't receive that and your youth group parents, whether you're incoming seventh graders or existing, please let me know and we'll get that out to you so you can sign up uh, your teens for that. Also, one last reminder that tomorrow night is our all-church gathering at 7 o'clock here at PCF. Um, and so we're doing uh, three major things, voting on our new fiscal year budget, uh, voting on bringing Harry Marshall on as a, an elder again, uh, and also talking about and the application of some of the surplus that God has uh, blessed us with uh, this year. So that's tomorrow, 7 o'clock. If you're unable to make it here in person because of health reasons, please let us know. Uh, we can provide a Zoom link uh, to make sure you can still uh, participate in all of that. Well, as we enter into our worship this morning, uh, I want us to enter into uh, worship with the amazing reminder of the amazing characteristics of our God, that he is glorious, majestic, strong, beautiful, holy. And to know all these things, to know who God is, the weight of his, his glory is to allow us, to make us, to tremble before him. Psalm 96 says it this way, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day, 
Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Want us in the vein of trembling before him, coming humbly and in awe of our God. I want to confess on our behalf uh, just our shortcoming, shortcomings in ascribing the glory due God's name. So if you would bow your heads with me. Lord, we confess that in our selfish pursuit of the things of the world, we so often fail to see and savor your splendor and your majesty. Uh, the eyes of our hearts are prone to look for, for beauty in the temporary things of the world rather than being enamored with the beauty of the splendor of your holiness. Lord, in you alone are strength and glory. And yet we tend to glory in our own strength and in our own abilities. Lord, forgive us for not telling the nations of the great salvation that we have, that we have been given in you. Failing to consistently give testimony to your goodness and grace to those around us. So, Lord, we ask that you would lead us in repentance of these things. To receive your grace and to turn from our selfishness and turn to the freedom you have given us in Christ as grace. Lord, thank you. I'd like us to recite together Colossians 3. That's on the, the front wall here. Uh, in your worship guide, if you're watching online. And this is the gospel assurance, what Jesus has purchased for us. And if we'd recite that together. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So the removal of our transgressions, our sins, are done by God's grace through Christ who gave himself to purchase our forgiveness. And just as Christ died, we die with Christ. But just as we die with Christ, we are also risen along with Christ in glory, made alive in Christ. Same chapter in Colossians says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What a promise for God's people. I'd like to invite Catherine Grubb up to the front this morning. And Catherine, you can come on up. And Catherine's graciously agreed to give a testimony of God's grace and goodness in her life uh, and really how he's used that to restore her uh, in many ways. And so I'll let her talk about that. Good morning. My name is Catherine Grubb, and um, I'm going to tell you two resurrection stories, one that happened over a lifetime and one that happened in an instant. So I grew up in the suburbs of Tulsa, Oklahoma, being very active in my home congregation, and I went to church three times a week, and my family was very, very involved. And I have many childhood memories of being part of, like, the tear up, tear down, rearranging the actual physical labor of having church. And um, in those memories, I, was, I don't have very many that were not filled with a lot of harsh criticism or unreasonable demands of a child or um, criticism, uh, just verbal abuse about the situation. And so I have a lot of negativity, negative memories of, associated with that. And I didn't know until I was in my 40s just how profoundly that affected me. 
Now, in 2014, with a new family, I came to PCF. And right away, my teenagers and my husband were very excited to willing and willing to serve in this body. And when I signed up for stuff, I found that I reacted very badly. I so often would have like um, breathing trouble, or my heart would heart rate would elevate. Sometimes I would cry uncontrollably. Sometimes I just wanted to like go in the bathroom and hide. And it. I really didn't understand why God would put me in a position with this command to serve if this was the type of service that I could give, which is pretty miserable. So I called out to God and I asked him what I should do. And he said, start saying no. When someone says, can you put up a chair? Say no. When someone says, can you serve a nursery or make a meal? or do anything that's an act of service in the body of congregation, say no. Well, okay, that's easy. I'll do that. And so it turned out that as my family got more involved, I had to drive them. We had one car, and so that was a nice, safe thing for me to do. But then in the spring of 2019, Jeff sent me this long email listing all of my qualifications and my skill set and asked me, that he thought I was the perfect candidate to organize the float for the 4th of July parade. And I'm like, well, no way. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and, but the more I th- read that, and the more I realized I had all these capable teenagers in my home that are good at stuff like this, I thought, okay. God said, say yes, you'll have help. Okay, I'll say yes, thinking that they would take over. But then they had the audacity of getting summer jobs and leaving me because they had to pay for education or something. And so, so that left me and a team of moms to put on this float. And it turned out we did a pretty good job and we had fun. And in the course of it, I didn't have any anxiety issues. I didn't cry well over anything important. And so, and, and I actually thought I would even do this again if somebody asked me. So then last summer, okay, that's part of my resurrection story. This is the instant one. Last summer, I was reading my Bible by a pond in air, and I read Jeremiah 33.3, call to me, and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Well, I love that verse, and I'm like, great and unsearchable things. I know God is good, and he's got things up his sleeve. Yes, bring it. What do you got for me? Great and unsearchable things. I'll take it. And almost within a minute, I get a Facebook notification. It turns out there is a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma in her 30s who, in 1994, when she was 10 years old, was one of my fourth graders when I was her teacher. And she had this long public list of all the ways that I had influenced her life all the 27 years ago. And she went on and on, all these happy memories and how she had come from discouragement to encouragement. And then other students were chiming in about, oh, I remember that year. It was so great. I love this. And they're still talking about it all these years later. Except that that's not what I remember. I remember being called into the principal's office constantly because I couldn't keep up with my administrative responsibilities. I remember being at odds with parents over the silliest things. I remember being ostracized by faculty members. I was asked not to come back. They were not going to renew my contract. So for the last 27 years, I had carried this memory of failure. But in an instant, her post turned it into a story of success. Great and unsearchable things, no doubt. So then there is more to come. In the course of last fall, during COVID, we had to come up the... Jeff and Stephen and I had to come up with some ideas on how we can minister to our kids. And I got asked to do more and more online activities. And the more I did, the more fun I had doing it. And I got more, I would lay awake at night thinking of ideas of what we could do. And I even sent an email in November, please give me more to do. I'm having so much fun. And what had turned into a season of no was now becoming more of a season of yes. And I really didn't understand it. And then this last March, Stephen and Jeff asked me, if I would take on the responsibility of being the children's ministry coordinator. So I would be in in charge of all of Sunday school and all of children's church. And I said, yes, I want to do this. This sounds like a lot of fun. And it it, it turns out I've got all the skill set required to do this and have fun doing it. 
So the reason I'm telling you all this story is because I believe God is asking us, especially now that we're restarting so many new things, is this a season for you to say yes or is it a season to say no? If he says no, it's okay. There's time for healing. But it's a season of yes. You're going to have help. And perhaps, you know, you don't know. There are great and searchable things that are God is going to bless you with in this ministry. You have no idea. It might even take 27 years for you to really see the full picture. But I would like to encourage you. That we, have, we have so many resurrection stories. We have so much to be excited about. And we get a chance to serve, especially with the little ones, the weakest and smallest among us who need to hear this early can we serve them in this way? Anyway, I'm happy to share with you more resurrection stories, and I would love for you to help me in this mission. So talk to me. Send me an email. Talk to church office. We'll sign you up if you want. <laughs> anyway, that's my resurrection story. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Catherine. Very encouraging. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for what we just heard from Catherine, for the ways you have worked in her life to draw her deeper into Christian community, for how you've given her joy as you use her gifting to build up your church. And Christ, I pray that all of us will realize our sacred privilege and our sacred responsibility of being deeply connected with your church, your body on earth. Pray that you'll give us a willingness to, to serve and love one another. I ask you to grant us humility and patience with each other. And we pray that Christian community will be for each one of us not just one more activity in our busy schedules that we need to somehow find a place for, but rather the organizing center from which we live lives that honor you in every other sphere. Christ Jesus, as each member of your body works properly, please make your body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And do this for your name's sake, O oh God, in this church and in countless other churches around this nation and around the world in order to display your wisdom to the world and to the entire cosmos through your bride, through the church. Thank you for how our life group leaders model this very thing for us week in, week out, with their diligence and integrity and all the ways in which they care for and shepherd your people. And as our life group year comes to a close and some of our groups break for the summer, we want to thank you for these leaders Thank you, Lord, for Peter and Marianne Schooneman, for Bob and Jen Meisner, and Jeff and Christy Willette, for Mike and Caitlin Litchfield, and James and Elaine Lunsford, and Archer and Kimberly Batchelor, and Joel and Megan Richter. Thank you for Gavin and Jillian Price Lewis, and John and Barbara Fleming, and Tom and Mary Beale and Ed and Kareen Renault. And we honor these men and women and give you great thanks for them. Father, I pray that you'll keep each one walking closely with you and fruitful in their lives and ministries. I pray that they will know our gratitude to them. When we think of those who love your church and serve you by serving your people, we think of our dear sister, Kathy Crooker, whose death we are grieving. We're going to miss her cheerful smile, her prayerfulness and kindness, her sense of humor, her joy in the midst of serious suffering, her unwavering commitment to you. And so we ask you to walk with Walt and Megan and Jamie and Ashley and AJ and the rest of the family through this season of mourning. And Lord, I pray that the things that we love most about Kathy we will seek to emulate ourselves for the sake of others in our lives. I pray that Kathy's legacy of faith will be carried on here for many, many years to come at PCF. Thank you, Father, that you call each one of us to work hard and to be productive and to make a difference in the world through our work. 
and also that you call us to have seasons of rest when we stop working. Thank you that you yourself modeled this for us in the first week of creation and that the Lord Jesus took time away from his ministry to be with you. And so, Father, I pray that we as your people will rest well this summer. We know that there are many in the world today who cannot stop what they do because they have no margin and they work to survive. And as we pray for them and ask you for provision, we thank you for your superabundant blessing in our lives that makes it possible for us to stop for seasons of time. We don't take that for granted. Pray that we'll get some time to stop working this summer, that we'll spend time with you and with family, that we'll relax and enjoy your creation. Please remind us through our resting that the world will go on without our work, that we are dispensable and only you are indispensable. Please free us from thinking too highly of ourselves and lead us to think much more highly of you and give us joy and refreshment. And I pray, O oh God, that our resting over the summer will not be a coasting or a spiritual drifting, but instead it will have just the opposite effect. It will fuel our pursuit of you and draw us closer into relationship with you. Please refresh us now with your word. May it be treasure to us. May it be more valuable to us than many gold or silver pieces. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We ask it for the sake of Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to take a Bible and open up to Hebrews chapter 8. If you need a Bible, we have some giveaway Bibles in the foyer. Feel free to run out and grab one of those. Or if you need a a Bible, we also have some pew Bibles that can uh, be handed to you. So if you need one, just raise a hand in the air. Hold up that hand long enough for David or Mike to spot you and hand it to you. And as that's happening, I want to invite you one last time to join me this coming Saturday for a a, a baptism class here at the church from 9 to 11 a.m. If you are a believer and you are not yet baptized, I would love to just have that time with you. We'll talk about, again, what it means to be a Christian, and we'll talk about what baptism is, and this would be to prepare you to be baptized at the end of the summer in August for our all-church baptism. So please If you're interested in that, uh, sign up by letting me know. You can email me or give me a phone call. My my info is on the back of the bulletin. All right, I'm going to read our passage. It's a short passage. It's Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. So if you're there in your Bible, you can follow along as I read aloud. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. This is the word of the Lord. I read a lot of books out loud to our children. It's one of the the favorite things that we do as a family and Uh, I admit sometimes, although I've really enjoyed doing that over the years, sometimes I have uh, aimed a little uh, in error when I've kind of tried to figure out which books I'm going to read with the family, and I've I've been a little too optimistic and aimed a little too high. Uh, Earlier this year, I tried to read Great Expectations by Charles Dickens to the family, because I love that book and have read it over the years, and we made it about 100 pages in, and I realized, oop, you know what? I've forgotten how incredibly complex the syntax of these sentences is and how you know, the, the vocabulary is really difficult. And so basically we said after 100 pages, you know what, let's save this for five years and come back in five years, try it then. But what, what happened was Emma and I found that uh, I would read a paragraph and then we would spend a little time translating from the English to the English, (laughs) from uh, 19th century English to 21st century English. And I'd, you know, read a paragraph and then try to explain in my own words what what Charles Dickens had just said. In some ways, that's what the author of Hebrews is doing for us in those two verses I just read. If you've been tracking with us through Hebrews over the last number of months, you know this book can be pretty demanding 
to read. It's complicated. The background is different. We're not familiar, familiar with the, the world of Hebrews. And so I want you to see how the author begins in verse 1 of our passage. He says, now the point in what we are saying is this. And the word translated the point actually means the main point, the principal idea, the crowning and ultimate message. So he's saying the main point, the climax of what we've been saying is this. And I just have to pause and say this is a truly wonderful thing. Because sometimes we struggle, we, we, we agonize as we're reading the Bible and trying to figure out what it means, what a passage means or what an entire book means. And we say, uh, sometimes we just get lost. That we, we lose the forest for the trees. We, all the detail starts to get jumbled in our mind and we're just not sure what this all means. And so when a biblical author stops and tells us exactly what the main point of the passage or the book is, I'm listening. <laughs> Bring it on. Tell me. Tell me what this is. This is sort of like your middle school math teacher handing you the answer key to the test. Imagine how delighted and surprised you would be if that happened. The author says this is the main point in what we are saying. And he certainly means at least the main point of chapters 5 through 10, which is about this great high priest. And maybe he, he may well mean this is the main point of the entire book of Hebrews. So, since this is the, the, the crowning, ultimate idea of what he's saying, and since he actually pauses to tell us that it's the crowning, ultimate idea, I take it he believes it's something very important for us to know and think about carefully and consider diligently. So that's what I want to do. I want to focus especially on two phrases in the second half of verse 1, the phrase, we have... And the phrase, such a high priest. We have such a high priest. That's the whole sermon this morning, just focusing on those two phrases. And we'll take them in reverse order, starting with the phrase, such a high priest. The word that really interests me in that little phrase is the word such. We have such a high priest. And that suggests that we have not just any high priest, but a particular kind, a specific type of high priest, such a high priest. Of course, we know from the last couple weeks, we've been in Hebrews chapter 7, and if you've been following along in Hebrews 7, you'll know that the author goes to great lengths to distinguish two types of priesthood. On the one hand, there's the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, and on the other hand, there's this other different kind of Melchizedekian priesthood, a priest in the order of the Old Testament priest king, Melchizedek. And the author has been argued, uh, been arguing that Jesus is a priest in that order. He's uh, a Melchizedekian kind of high priest king rather than a Levitical priest. So the author is, when he says we have such a high priest, he is reiterating, he's saying, we have a high priest of a particular kind, not a one kind, but the other. So we should naturally ask, well, which kind? I, I think of that word such. We have such a high priest. It's sort of like a bucket. And the question is, how are we going to fill up that bucket with meaning? It's very important that we do, because if we can fill that word such with meaning, we'll have a better sense of who Jesus is what his work on our behalf is, what kind of high priest he is for us. We have such a high priest. Well, what, what kind of high priest do we have? How, how would we go about finding out, how do we go about discerning what kind of, of, of high priest we actually have? And I think obviously the answer is we should go back to what the author has told us to this point in the book of Hebrews. We have such a high priest. Well, author, tell us what kind of high priest. Well, he's been doing that for the past seven chapters. So I want to look back at what he's told us to this point in the book about Jesus as a high priest and then forward at the rest of verse 1 and verse 2 in order to fill up this term such, such a high priest. 
I did something really simple this past week in order to refresh my memory about what the author's been telling us to this point in the book. This is something you could easily do yourself. I just searched for the word high priest in the book of Hebrews up to this point, up to chapter 8, and then read through those passages we've been studying, thinking about what the author is telling us about who Jesus is as our high priest. And this is majorly encouraging. Let me just give you a brief overview and highlight tour of Jesus as high priest to this point in the book. We have the kind of high priest. The author says we have such a high priest. We have a particular kind of high priest. What kind? He tells us we have the kind of high priest who can deal with our sin and who wants to deal with our sin. And I draw this from chapter 2, verse 17, which says Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation refers to Jesus turning away or diverting the the just wrath of God. It refers to him taking it upon himself so that it doesn't fall upon us. And he does that when he dies on the cross. In Hebrews, this is really remarkable, Jesus is both the priest who offers the propitiatory sacrifice He's the priest who offers the sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God. And he is himself the sacrifice. He's the priest and the sacrifice, both. And Jesus doesn't just offer this sacrifice. He's not just able to offer this sacrifice. What Hebrews tells us about our high priest is that he wants to do it. I see that in those words in chapter 2, verse 17, that Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. He is inclined toward us. He is disposed to help us. The kind of high priest that the author has been describing for the first seven chapters of Hebrews is not an aloof, uncaring, distant, powerful, but not really interested high priest. Just the opposite. He is a merciful and faithful high priest. So he is keenly aware of our need, And he is strongly inclined to do something about our need by helping us. And by the way, his death atones for sin because he himself is sinless. Chapter 4, verse 15 says he's a high priest without sin. So that when he dies on the cross, he's not dying for his own sin, but rather the sin of others, those for whom he's dying. That's the kind of high priest The author tells us in chapter 8, verse 1, is the main point of everything he's saying. This kind of merciful and faithful high priest, this one who, who can help us and who wants to help us, that's the main point of the book. Here's another one. I don't have time to go through all these passages, so this is just a couple of them to give us a flavor, to give us some highlights. The author of Hebrews has told us to this point, we have a risen, ascended, triumphant, reigning high priest. And I draw that from chapter 4, verse 14, which says that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. So our high priest has died. He had to die in order to propitiate the wrath of God, to turn it away from us. But he didn't stay dead. Praise God, he didn't stay dead. Jesus, our deceased high priest rose from the dead and he didn't just rise to resurrection life on earth. He didn't just have a resurrection body on this earth, great as that would have been. He rose from the dead and then he kept rising from the dead and he passed right through the heavens all the way, Hebrews tells us, to the right hand of the Father of God in heaven. He rose, he rose through the heavens and now he reigns at the right hand of Almighty God. So part of the point of identifying Jesus as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek is that Jesus isn't just a priest, great as that is for us, he's also a king. He's both at the same time. He reigns uh, in the presence of God, at the right hand of God. We know from chapter 5, verse 5, 
that he has this position as a high priest by the appointment of God himself. So God will hear him when he intercedes for us. We know from chapter 6, verse 20, that he will continue forever as a high priest. It's not just a blip. It's not just a momentary service or function. It's forever. And we know from chapter 7, verse 25, that as our high priest, he always lives to make intercession to the Father for us. Remember, the author says in chapter 8, verse 1, that identifying and describing this high priest, this particular kind of high priest, is the main point of everything he is saying. He wants us to know this. He wants us to treasure this. And in order to fill up that word such, we have such a high priest, we should also turn the other direction and look what he's about to say. We've just been looking back at what he said to this point. We should also look at what he says in the rest of verse 1 and in verse 2. Here's what he says. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So that mention of Jesus as a high priest seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, which is a reverent way of referring to God the Father himself, that takes us all the way back to the third verse of the entire book. Chapter 1, verse 3 says, after making purification for sins, that's what a high priest does. High priest makes purification for sins. After doing that, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down because his work of atonement was complete. There was nothing more he needed to do. It was finished. He had averted the the wrath of God. His, his work was complete, and he sat down because, as we just saw, he rules with God the Father over the entire universe. Remember, the author has been drawing very extensively on Psalm 110 up to this point in the letter. And I suppose if you ask the author of Hebrews, what's your favorite Bible passage? It'd be pretty likely that at least on his, in his top five would be Psalm 110. He's really been focusing on verse 4 of Psalm 110 up to this point, which talks about Jesus being a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. But he's also thinking, we know this from chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, he's thinking of verse 1 of Psalm 110, which says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. In other words, come up, join me on my throne, and rule the universe together with me. That's what Jesus is doing. That's the kind of high priest he is. And chapter 8, verse 2 goes on to say that the kind of high priest the author is talking about is also a minister in the, true, in, the, in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. That emphasis on Jesus as a heavenly high priest, as one who is in the true and heavenly tent is going to be the focus of chapters 8 and 9 of Hebrews. And this is important because it shows these two little verses, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8, you might say are a pivot point or a hinge for the book because they look backward to what's come before and they look forward to the argument of the author in chapters 8, 9, and the rest of the book. So to summarize, what kind of high priest do we have? Such a high priest, what kind? this kind of high priest, everything we've just seen. And the author says that's the main point of this section. That's the main thing. If if you're going to take away something from Hebrews 1 to 7, take this away. Jesus is this particular kind of high priest. So don't miss it and don't ignore it and don't minimize it. Don't forget it. This is the most important thing for you to hear. Don't be more absorbed with politics than this. Don't be more absorbed with personal appearance than this. Don't be more absorbed with your lawn 
than this, or recreational activities, or family, or whatever. The author says, this is the most important point. I mean, it's just good for us to think, what wakes us up in the morning? What are we excited about? What captivates our thought, and our energy, and our focus? And this is, this is where it's at for the author. He says, this is the main point. We have this kind of high priest, so care about it, and think about it, and Go deeper into it, plumb its depths. We have this kind of high priest. Now, I want you to notice something else about verse 1 that's very important and very encouraging. And let's start by noticing first what the author does not say in verse 1. Here's what he does not say. He doesn't say, now the point in what we are saying is this, there is such a high priest. He doesn't say that. He could say that. That would be true. But that's not the way he says it. Instead, what does he say? Here's what he says. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. In other words, this one we've just been talking about for seven chapters. This one who is the main point of everything we've been saying all, this one I've been laboring so hard to communicate to you. Th- this, is, this is not an academic point. This is not a theoretical point I'm making, the author says. Rather, it's a personal and pastoral point. And here's the main point. We have such a high priest. Not, not just there is one out there, but rather he belongs to us. There's this very close connection between we and the high priest. And the connection is this, the high priest belongs to the we. We have him. We have such a high priest. Now, the author's already said this a couple times in the letter. He said it back in chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest. He said it again in chapter 7, verse 26. It was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. And here's the significance of saying it this way. It's not just that Jesus takes away sin in general. It's that he takes away our sin in particular. We have, we are united to him. He belongs to us. We have such a high priest. It's not just that Jesus is a priest forever, but that he's our priest forever. He's not just an advocate He is our advocate. Jesus is not just a priest out there somewhere else. He's a priest right here for us. We have him. We have such a high priest. This is the difference between saying there are parents standing over there and those are my parents standing over there. It's the difference between saying that's a wife and saying she's my wife. It's the difference between hearing the story of how Jeff Bezos built his fortune through Amazon and learning that Jeff Bezos, as he was building that fortune, meant to give the whole thing to you one day. Would you listen to that story a little bit differently if you knew that you were the, heir, the appointed heir of the Bezos fortune? God, God says, it's not just that there is a high priest, It's that everything about that high priest is put to work for you. We have such a high, we're part of the story. The high priest is doing what he's doing in relationship with and for us. We have a great high priest. So it's really crucial to ask who exactly is the we in the phrase we have. We have such a high, well, who is the we? We need to be part of the we if we're going to have the high priest. Sometimes in the book of Hebrews, the word we refers to the author of the letter in distinction from the recipients, the hearers or readers of the letter. And actually, if you look at verse 1, you'll see there are two uses of the word we in verse 1. And the first one refers only to the author. It doesn't refer to the readers or the hearers of the letter. Now the point, he, the author says, now the point in what we are saying, the hearers and readers aren't saying it, the author is saying it. So that we refers just to the author. But very often, the word we refers both to the author 
and to the recipients of the letter. And that's clearly the sense here in the phrase, we have such a high priest. He means all of us together who belong to Christ. The author is saying that Jesus is a high priest for a group of people. He's not a high priest for every single person in the world. He is a high priest for we. So again, the crucial question is, how can people be included in the we of verse 1 so that Jesus is not just a high priest, but our high priest, so that we belong to him and he belongs to us? And thankfully, the book of Hebrews has an answer to that question. The book of Hebrews tells us how we can belong to that group who have Christ as our high priest. Let me, uh, let me show you a few passages that lay this out. Chapter 2, verse 13 shows us that God the Father must give us to the Son. Jesus talks about brothers whom the Father has given to him. And that means that our salvation is ultimately a work of the grace of God. It doesn't ultimately come down to how virtuous or how morally upright we are. It's ultimately the initiative and the gift of God the Father to God the Son. God does, God, God, God gives us this gift. He gives this gift to His Son, this gift of us. But of course, He works this gift out in our lives. So chapter 2, verse 1 says there is a point where we hear about this salvation. We learn about Jesus' teaching. We learn about the testimony of the first eyewitnesses, the works of the Holy Spirit in attesting to the truth of the gospel. And we must hear this good news. That's why the Christian church has always been a missionary organization. It's why people have gone cross-cultural and linguistic barriers because we believe as Christians that people must be confronted with the gospel. They must hear the gospel. And once we've heard the gospel, we must choose whether to believe and trust in God or not. Chapter 4, verse 3 says that we who have believed enter into God's rest, into salvation. So not everyone is saved. The saving gospel message, in fact, the, the author of Hebrews says That saving gospel message is of no benefit whatsoever if it's not united with faith in the hearts of those who hear it. And saving faith is a resting, it's a trusting in God. Often, if we're honest, we'll confess that we trust in ourselves or in job titles or performance or other people. And saving faith renounces all those false gods and says, instead of trusting in myself or others, I'm going to trust wholly in God for salvation. But one time, momentary faith, boy, we've seen this so many times in the book of Hebrews, is not sufficient. It's not adequate. The author of Hebrews tells us we must go on believing. True faith, true saving faith, in, in that moment of belief is, is a seed that will bear the fruit of ongoing, persevering faith. And we see this in chapter 3, verse 14, which says, For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We share in Christ, in all that He is for us, including serving as our high priest. We share in Him if we trust in Him and hold our original confidence firm to the end. If we do that, if we place our trust in Christ, and if we hold fast to Him, we will be part of that group of desperate sinners who can say, we have such a high priest. We have such a high priest. His perfection will be for us. His death will be for us. His resurrection will be for us. His ascension through the heavens will be for us. His present high priestly intercession to the Father will be for us. His kingly reign in heaven from the throne of God will be for us. His glorious return from heaven to earth will be for us. And his creation of new heavens and new earth will be for us. It won't be just out there. It will be right here. And it won't be just general It will be specific, and it will be personal. It will be for us. So please, don't delay. 
to place your trust in Jesus as your high priest. Do it today. Do it now. You don't know what today, later today, tomorrow, this week will bring. So speak to me after the service, and I would love to pray with you as you place your trust in Jesus. And if you've already trusted in him, I want to let the author of Hebrews speak directly to you because he has a word for you. If Jesus is already your high priest, here's what he says to you. It's in chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. What are we to do? Here's what he says. Let us hold fast our confession. And if you've been walking with us through Hebrews to this point, you know this is not the first time he said it. He says it over and over again. If you're trusting in Jesus, if he's your high priest, hold fast to him. Don't let him go. Persevere. Don't get distracted by something that feels better or seems more enticing in the moment or seems more reliable or trustworthy in the moment. Hold fast to Jesus. And you say, you know, to the author of Hebrews, why do you keep saying this over and over again? Why do you keep on telling me, hold fast, persevere, don't drift, don't let go? And the answer comes back because you need to hear it over and over again. Our life groups have been going through First and Second Peter, and Peter talks a lot about reminding his readers of things they already know. He says, that's why I wrote these, these letters, because I, I want to remind you of things you know already. Well, why do we need to be reminded? Because we forget. I forget. I know these things, and then tomorrow I won't feel them. And so I need to be reminded again of who Jesus is as my high priest. Not just reminded up here, but, but down here where it counts. I, I need my affection stirred. I, I pray that as we hear the author tell us, Jesus is our high priest, that we will plumb these depths again, that, that we'll go deep into what it means that Jesus is a high priest and that Jesus is our high priest, that he is all these things for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do pray for each one of us. I pray for any of us who haven't rested in Jesus as the one who goes to the Father for us, who's never rested that way in you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will draw each of us into that kind of relationship with you. I pray for those who have trusted in you and those who would say, Jesus is my high priest, that each one of us will hold fast and not let go. I pray that we will go deeper in our thinking and feeling that we will appreciate more what it means that you, Lord Jesus, intercede to the Father for us, that you are our high priest forever, and that this awesome truth will captivate us more than other things. You know our hearts. You know what wakes us up in the morning. You know what stirs our energy, our affections, what we get most passionate about. And I thank you for the author who says, here's the main point. Here's the thing to focus on. Here's the thing not to let go of. Lord Jesus, be our vision. Captivate us. We praise you as our great priest king. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him on the side lawn of churches. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is time to get our children back together. Praise the Lord. And we are doing a new thing. Since Clara, who is my third child, was a baby, I've been doing worship wiggles with my own children at the start of most of our homeschool days. What began from a desire to get their wiggles out and teach them some of the worship songs I knew as a child 
It has become a way for us to all prioritize worship and orient our hearts to Jesus before we start our work for the day. I can't tell you how many mornings my grumpiness has tearfully changed to repentance and joy as I jump down, turn around, touch the ground, and praise my Lord. So starting next week, we have the opportunity to worship and wiggle outside with our children between the services on the church, so- church lawn on the library side of the building. Please see the details in the newsletter. We'll have hula hoops set up, and we'll help kids have plenty of personal space, and we will have a ton of fun worshiping and learning God's truth together. Now, this is for all children. All of my children will be there, so everyone from nursery to high school will have a buddy. And parents, we really want you to come and to participate, not to watch, so that we can set an example of joyful worship for our children. So now, if you will rise and stand with me, we are going to worship and wiggle together to give the whole PCF family an opportunity to praise God with dancing and with every breath. Oh, and thanks, Brian. On this side, follow Noel. On this side, follow me. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Praise, what's that? It's the yippee yahoo way to go, God. Praise, what's that? It's the yippee yahoo way to go, God. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Praise, what's that? It's the yippee yahoo way. Thank you. Please remain standing. As we worship Jesus, our high priest, the one who mediates for us a new, better covenant with God based on better promises. Glory in 
Father God, we recognize the universe is your work, a work of immeasurable brilliance, crafted with love and grace and inhabited by your presence, the creator whose word called everything into being and whose world sings of your glory. 
we recognize that your creation was made out of the overflow of your lavish, lavish, exuberant love, a reflection of the way you, your beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit live in harmony, love, and community with one another. And so, God, we worship you. We worship you, triune God, in song. sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin and sings my soul my savior God to be how great thou art, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god Sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. Glorious God, it is the flame of our lives to worship you, the crown and glory of our souls to adore you, heavenly pleasure to approach you. Give us power by your spirit to help us worship you that we may forget the world, be brought into fullness of life, be refreshed, 
comforted, blessed. Give us Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God, that we may be drawn near with brotherly love, with holy boldness. He is our mediator, intercessor, sacrificial lamb. Him we glorify, and in him we are set on high. Crowns to give, we have none, but what you have given, we return. So let us live holy to our Savior, free from distractions, from worry, from hindrances to the pursuit of the narrow way. We are pardoned through the blood of Jesus. Give us a new sense of it. Continue to pardon us by it. May we come every day to the fountain and every day be washed anew that we may worship you always in spirit and truth. alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied Sting
Our high priest uh, came not simply, not only to forgive us, great as that would be, not only to avert the wrath of God from us, but amazingly to transform us, to change us from the inside out, and then to use us to reach other people. And I want you to hear that in the benediction. This is from the last chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.